Good morning, class. <clears throat> oh, you're definitely getting morning, Mrs. Barrett. Where in the world is Mrs. Barrett today? <clears throat> Let's see. Wow, look at that back there. Huh. Where could this be? Okay, let's jump into the book. I think the background's prettier than I am this morning, so I'm gonna leave the light on the background. We're gonna start on chapter 23. <clears throat> Without saying a word, Sam passed me, and not so much as looking around, started walking fast. I had no choice but to trail after, hurrying to keep up. As I looked at him, I could see how tense his body was. It seemed as if he wanted to get away from something. Perhaps it was me. Was he angry? He picked his way through the disorder of tents and shacks as if leading me through a maze. Hoping I could get him to speak, I called out, <clears throat> why do you keep playing that song? I often think of writing home. Wish I were home. He snapped without looking around. He continued on at that same pace until he stopped abruptly and turned around. I could see his eyes shifting as if checking to see if we were alone. Like that. Apparently satisfied that we were, he said. That man you was talking about, you were talking about, the one who said he hadn't seen your brother, his name is Castle. Mr. John Castle. Why didn't you say so before? My father's fearful of him, and I'm not gonna pretend I'm not too. Fearful? But why? Who is he? Mr. Castle runs Mercury, our boss. If we say anything bad about him and he hears about it, no telling what he'll do. A lot of people around here don't like us. I don't understand. Momentarily, his eyes shifted away from me, and then he looked right at me. I'm guessing you know some people don't like Negroes. I wanted to say that wasn't me, but his severe tone and bluntness tied my tongue. I stared at him, hoping to hear more. I told you this morning, he went on, we're from New York State town of Sag Harbor. Nothing like San Francisco. Small whaling town. There's no slavery in New York. We're free men. My brother and I and other kids went to school, church. Best of all, we'd roam around, swim, fish, just live. Then my father wanted to try for the gold here. Thought he could get rich. Like my father, I said. There was a converted whaling ship, continued Sam, the General Parsons, coming out from Sag Harbor, one of the early ones. I had already sailed on her. We'd hi hired on, we hired on as shipmen and musicians. Soon as we got here, this past July, the whole crew rushed to the diggings. We went too, but we were run out. Not just us, Mexicans, people from Chile. We had to come back to town with almost no money. Nothing we could do, Sam went on, but stay here. Work as musicians until we saved enough money to buy our way back to New York. But direct to New York, you see, safe and sure. No slavery in California, but the problem is we can't go back east just anywhere. Has to be New York or Massachusetts, free states. If we go to the Carolinas, states like that, they might turn us into slaves. I nodded, even as I tried to make sense of it all, which is why we work for Mr. Castle. It's what we have to do to make money. <clears throat> Can you understand all that? I think so, I said. 
unnerved by his tale. Then I found the voice to say, I'm sorry for your troubles. The words sounded weak to my own ears. I stood there feeling stupid, not knowing what else to say, all too aware that Sam was watching me closely. But then I said, do you think this Mr. Castle knows something about my brother? No idea, but I'd trust him like I'd trust a snake with fangs at both ends. Let me tell you something, girl. He paused as if to, needing to decide to go on. This morning, he continued, after you left, Castle came back and asked me if I had spoken to a white girl. Said I wasn't allowed to do that. He did? I knew it was you he was talking about, but no telling what Castle might do. So I lied, said I hadn't. I hope you can understand that. Just trying to protect ourselves. Now I've spoken too much. My father didn't want me to say anything. Why? I just told you, he said, this time with anger. And then he turned about and said, let's go. And once more, he began to lead the way. But he didn't take five steps when one, oh, that was a little loud. When he once again stopped and faced me. I'm guessing you have no idea what a, a crimp is, do you? I remembered that Jacob had used that word. Something about kidnapping. Not being sure, I shook my head. All these sh ships that come here like ours, the General Parsons, soon as they arrive, they lose their crews. Head for that gold, so the ships can't go anywhere. Remembering what had happened when the Stephanie K reached San Francisco and the whole crew went off, I said, Rotten Row. Exactly, Rotten Row. Ships just sitting in the cove, or like the Mercury, turned into a saloon which means captains get desperate for sailors so they can sail back home. Get frantic enough, they come to Castle. He's a crimp. He feeds drink or drugs to people who are in the Mercury. When they pass out, Castle sells them to the captains for crew. Gets good money for each one he hands over. The Mercury being right on the water, it's easy to deliver them. When they wake up, they're at sea. Drugs them? I cried, my heart lurching. Sells them? You never heard it from me. But, but that's slavery. Don't even try to tell me anything about slavery. White folks think slavery is just about black people. Don't you believe it? But I'll tell you something, Miss Tory. My father and I, we never eat or drink anything in the Mercury. Too risky. That Mr. Castle, he suits up fine, but he's as savage as a meat axe. He'd mince his mother for money. That's why my father told me to say nothing to you. Not protect to protect you, but us. Now that you know, do us a big favor and keep away shocked. I just stood there. Sam, as if he noticed my reaction, said nothing, only turned about and started walking again. I hurried after him. But once again, he stopped. I'll tell you another thing, he said. If Castle took your brother, that means it's for a ship that's sailing soon. Soon, I cried. How soon? No idea. Quick. Why? Because the sooner that crimped person gets sailed off, the better. Makes sense, doesn't it? He's gone. No body, no crime. Vanished. You won't ever see him again. Ever. That's the way Castle works. I think I may have actually gulped. Are you saying Jacob might already be gone? 
Not answering, Sam resumed walking, as if trying to get away from what he had already revealed. Over his shoulder, he said, You said you know about the Rotten Row ships, right? I nodded, all but running to keep as close to him as possible. He said, What I've heard, and I believe it, is that the crimps hide the ones they kidnap on one of those empty ships. Who's going to be able to find them there? Can't search all of them, can you? Too many. Impossible. Castle hides the ones he has sold on an empty ship till the last minute, before a departing boat sails off. That makes it safer for him. Safe for the captain on the ship. Understand now? It is... Is anything to do against... Is there anything to do against, against this Mr. Castle? You can be sure. I'm always trying to think of that. Sometimes when we're playing, he comes back and says, play such and such for a particular customer. You know what I do? I play it badly. Maybe he'll lose that customer and he'll go off. I know it's not much, but it's something because Castle holds all of the power. Here you go, he said, turning round. You're out of Happy Valley. I couldn't move. But you're telling me my brother might be on one of those rotten ships and is, is about to be stolen away. I'm not telling you anything. All I know is that's what Castle does. Altogether stunned, I said, if Jacob is on some rotten row ship, there's so many out there, how will I ever find him? Sam held out an open hand. That's just what I'm saying. You probably can't. But if you do go looking, you better work fast, or you better, or you can say goodbye to Brother Jacob, because you'll never find him. But I'll thank you, Miss Tory, not to say one word that it was me who told you all this. Because if you do, I'll put my hand on 12 Bibles and swear you're lying. Understand? Good luck. And do me a favor. Don't come back into the Mercury. And don't come back here to us either. Thank you. I mumbled as Sam turned around and took a step away. Sam, I called after him again. Thank you. He stopped. I said, why, why did you tell me all this? He looked at me. It's not for you. I hate Castle. He's the devil in a tall hat. He stole my brother, gone just like I told you. No idea where he is. I'd do anything to work something against Castle. Sometimes it feels like he has a whole army and there's just me and my pa and we're a long way from home. Which, he added fiercely, is why I keep playing that song. Wish I were home. Before I could say any more, Sam disappeared into the jumble that was called Happy Valley, which was not a valley and was not happy. Wow. I never really thought about how it would be to be a black person traveling during the slavery times and how careful you had to be. They really are stuck in a way that Tori's family cannot even imagine being stuck. And I didn't think about the fact that they might be run off from trying to get the gold like the other gold miners. Interesting. Let's jump into chapter 24. Jacob kidnapped, crimped, stolen away. To say I was shocked is too mild. I might as well use other words such as dumbstruck, appalled, and finally helpless. Never had I been so frightened, except the bigger truth was, I didn't know what to do. Numb. 
Some parts of me did not even want to believe what Sam had suggested. It was too horrific. Or maybe he was just trying to get me to go away, scare me off. Next moment, I realized how much he had helped me. After all, he had been told not to speak to me by his father and by Mr. Castle. But although Sam didn't owe me or Jacob anything, he had told me a great deal at real risk. I was touched, grateful. There was something else. If I didn't want to believe it, the only way to prove Sam wrong was to find Jacob or have Jacob show up on his own. Otherwise, I had to believe Sam, didn't I? But if what Sam said was true, I must find Jacob fast or he'd disappear forever. Wildly struggling for breath, trying desperately to think of what I could do. I cannot say which hurt more, my head, my stomach, or my heart. Somehow, I made my way back into town. Once there, I went to Montgomery Street and stood on the edge of the cove. From that vantage point, I gazed out at the forsaken ships, which is to say Rotten Row. The truth is, I had not spent much time thinking about the ships. Yes, they were there when our ship landed, and I had been curious about them, noticing that their numbers had much increased since we arrived. There were many hundreds now. But as far as I've been concerned, they were simply part of the madness that was San Francisco. Yes, odd, truly strange, but not for a moment did I consider they might have anything to do with me or Jacob. But as I stood on that beach, that moment, and observed the empty ships, I saw the bulky, rotting hulks with altogether different eyes. It may seem fantastical, but crowded together as they were, some wedged so tightly, I could have walked from one to another. They seemed alive, distressingly alive. Since the cove waters rippled some, the unoccupied shifts, ships shifted slightly, chafing and bumping one against another, making squeaking, grinding, and rasping sounds that reached the beach. It was almost as if the entire desolate fleet were some kind of wounded beast. Masts, spars, and yards poked out in a million different ways a bristled fiend's gave, or a gigantic multi-horned and spiked but dying monster. It's kind of an interesting picture she brings to mind of the ships. The idea that Jacob had been hidden away on one of one of those many ships swallowed Jonah-like was beyond horrifying because if it was true, how might I ever be able to find him? Never in my life had I been so unnerved. I was absolutely sick. With my insides feeling like they were stuffed with stones, I stood there more dead than alive. The more I stood there trying to make up my mind and control my feelings, the more I felt it was my fault Jacob was gone. Knowing he had been unhappy, I should never, as Mr. S as Senor Rosales gently hinted, have left him behind when I'd gone down to the bay with Thad. Let it be admitted, just the day before, I had pictured myself a grand, independent adult. It had been wonderful to think I was free and liberated. Now, I rued the moment. In truth, I'd grossly neglected my responsibilities. I had been arrogant. Do you wish to feel young? Be humiliated. And what if father or mother returned and I could not tell them where Jacob was? The thought made me nauseous. 
I must find Jacob. Yet how? I had no idea. Beyond all else, I felt terribly alone. Next moment, I was overcome by an urgent need to speak to someone as if to get away from my own frights. Yet understand, in San Francisco, other than in Happy Valley, there was no such thing as a neighborhood. It was not like Providence where I knew everyone who lived on Sheldon Street as they knew me. Yes, the tents near us were occupied, but the young men who lived in them came and went like so many wispy clouds in the sky. As for women, there were so few, and if they were not at saloons, they ran boarding houses or helped with a husband's business. I knew none. There was Senor Rosales, but he was overworked with his cafe. Who was I to turn to? As you might have guessed, it was that. I ran to the store where he worked and I found him quick enough. He was clerking behind one of the counters, offering shovels and picks to a boisterous line of new arrivals. Soon as he saw me, he called out, find him. Too agitated to talk, I merely shook my head. He must have seen how troubled I was because he said, what happened? I wasn't going to repeat aloud what Sam had told me. I only said, Come to my tent, soon as you can. Will do. <clears throat> I turned and fairly fled from the store, pushing my way through clouds, crowds of miners who jeered and rebuked me for my belligerence. I didn't care. I ran back uphill to our tent as fast as possible, forcing my way through the usual mobs. As I went, I kept repeating, the same prayer in my head. Be there, be there. Oh dear God, please let Jacob be there. I reached the tent and fairly well leapt inside. Jacob was not there. Whatever strength remained in me shrank to nothing, dissolved. I flung myself on Jacob's bed and burst into tears. I beg you to understand, crying was something I loathed, hated. But at that moment, I could not help myself. I sobbed, my whole body trembled, my chest hurt, I could barely breathe. What am I going to do? I wailed aloud. What am I going to do? I found mother's shawl and wrapped it around me. How I missed her. From across the way, I heard Senor Rosales call out, Correita, did you find him? He must have seen me rush into the tent. Perhaps he'd heard my cries. I sat up, worked to suppress my gulps of grief and pawed at my wet face. Correita, he called again. What is it? What is the matter? The next moment, Senor Rosales did something he had never done before. He stuck his head into our tent. Que paso? What did you learn about Jacob? What has happened? I looked up at him. My unhappy face must have revealed my ghastly feelings and frightened thoughts because he came all the way in. More, he squatted down before me and put out a kind hand which I clutched eagerly with both of mine, even as I wetted it with my tears. His gaze was full of sympathy. Correrita, por favor, you must tell me what's happened. Haltingly now and again, snuffling, struggling to keep from crumbling anew into sobs and tears, I told Senor Rosales all that Sam had told me and what I feared had happened to Jacob. His face showed alarm and anger. Santo Dios, he murmured, and made the sign of the cross over his chest more than once. I have heard rumors of such terrible things, he said. But Jacob, un niño, I warned your father, this place, Lobos, 
See, there are wolves here. Do you truly think that's what happened to him? Tears flowed down my cheeks. I don't know, I wailed. I just have to find him. It was hard for me to talk or breathe. Very well. On the square, the police chief, Senor Malki Fallon, has his office in the old schoolhouse. There are police officers as well. Someone will help. Do you think so? Correrita, Senor Fallon is la policia. He must find Jacob. It's his obligation. Come, I'll go with you. Will you? I said, deeply grateful for his help. Corderita, I have told you many times, I think of you as my daughter, Jacob, my son. My daughter isn't here because as I told your esteemed padre, this city is not safe for young people. Forgive me, his leaving you was a mistake. This proves me right. But since you are my local daughter, well then, I will help. I jumped up and hugged him, and he hugged me back. Vamos, he said. Now we must find Senor Fallon. As that boy Sam told you, if all of this is true, we must act rapidamente. Senor, I said, one thing, you cannot say anything about Sam. Why? He's worried he will be blamed. Fine, whatever you say. Now we must hurry. Uh-oh. Tori sort of hit on what I'm thinking there. Is this gonna end up being a problem for Sam? What do you think the police are going to do? Let's, I can't wait till we get to chapter 25. I wanna see what's going on there. Okay, my friends, that's where we're gonna stop today. That was chapters 23 and 24. And we have a new uh, day for where in the world is Mrs. Barrett. I'm gonna give you guys one last look. More people have woken up now. Okay, this will be a new guest. I think this is, is this number five? I'll count when I get off of here and I'll make sure I have the number right next time. Uh, take care and I'll see you for chapter 25 next. Bye.